We celebrate the kingship of, of Adonai, the kingship of God. And um, when we listen to the sounds of the shofar as they're blasted, uh, the sound of the shofar is meant to uh, inspire our hearts and, and uh, put inside of our hearts a fear and awe of the presence of Adonai, uh, coming into the presence of the, of, of the, of the king of all creation. And entering into the presence of the king of all creation is, is never anything that we should take lightly or casually. Uh, you know, because we see even in uh, ancient cultures uh, that you did not just simply enter into the presence of a king, that you had to be summoned into his presence. Um, and to be in the presence of a king with a small K um, was, uh, uh, was a, a tremendous experience and it was an awe-inspiring uh, experience as well uh, for most people to have that opportunity to actually stand in the presence of, of a king. But what we celebrate tonight is, is our ability to stand in the presence of the king with a capital K, the king of all kings, the king of the universe, the king of creation. And every year at Rosh Hashanah, uh, we listen to the sounds of the shofar and we listen with that anticipation in our hearts for the future sounding of the, the one shofar that we long to hear. And this is the sound of the shofar, the great shofar that Yeshua himself speaks of. And he speaks about this in Matthew 24, 31. And he says in verse 31, he's speaking about, uh, um, well, the prefaces that his Talmudim, his disciples are asking about uh, when, when they would know the season uh, of his return. And, uh, and he's speaking in, in regard to this and answering them. And he says regarding the shofar in verse 31, he will send out his angels with a great shofar and they will gather together his chosen people from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And that Yeshua is speaking about this great shofar, this great gathering that will take place. Um, and he's alluding to the prophecy that was spoken of by Zechariah. <laughs> who says that although the Lord has dispersed Israel to the four winds of heaven, that he will signal the exiled to come back, as if the shofar is a whistling, uh, whistling for them to return. And we see that the shofar also tells us that it is uh, the shofar of Messiah will awaken the righteous from dead. Uh, the Talmud itself states in Rosh Hashanah 16b, the Talmud states, that the dead will be raised. Uh, the uh, ancient um, ancient uh, scholars, the rabbinic scholars in the Talmud, they believed in the resurrection. And this actually corresponds to what, what Paul says, Rav Shaul, in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, when Paul's writing and says, it will take but a moment, the blink of an eye at the final shofar, for the shofar will sound, and the dead will be raised to live forever, and we too will be changed. So as we celebrate this day of Yom Teru, this day of, of the sounding of the shofar, uh, the head of a new year beginning, uh, we, we have great anticipation and excitement uh, because we're seeking, as we're listening to the sounds of the shofars blowing and sounding off, our longing and our heart's desire is to hear that great shofar. And when that great shofar sounds, that means that our Messiah is coming for us. And we will never, ever be separated from him again. It's, it's going to be probably the most beautiful noise that we'll ever hear, that great shofar when that blast sounds. And uh, it's something that we should uh, have in our hearts, that anticipation and that longing for, to hear that sound of the great shofar. The scriptures talks about uh, that we should always be in a state of readiness and prepared, and we should have a longing, uh, a longing for the presence of Adonai, and a, and a longing for the return of our Messiah, and uh, that those who are waiting for his return would be blessed. But as we uh, speak about Rosh Hashanah tonight, and again, it's about the celebration of the king. It's about the celebration 
of God as king, as Yeshua as king. And we come to know who we are by remembering who Adonai is. Because our identity is not based on ourselves. Our identity, your identity is not based on what you do for a living. Your identity is based on who you are as a believer in Yeshua. Your identity is based on who you are in Him. So when we remember that Adonai is our King, it helps us to understand who we are in our identity. Because we are, we are uh, not separate from Yeshua, but we are to be found in Him. And that we live in Him and through Him. And in acknowledging Adonai as our King, it puts the world and our position in this world into the proper perspective. You're not just somebody that's existing on this planet. You're not somebody that's just taking up space and breathing oxygen and leaving a carbon footprint, as so many people are concerned with. You are of the king. You're royalty. And the scriptures, the newer covenant scriptures tell us that we are a royal priesthood. You're royalty. You are of the king. You belong to the king. You belong to his kingdom. You are a co-heir to the kingdom of God as a believer in Messiah Yeshua. So when we really understand and we celebrate the kingship of God, it allows us to have the right perspective as to who we are and what our identity is. We're royalty. Not because of anything that we've done. It's not because of anything we've accomplished. We are royalty because of blood. We're royalty because of the blood of Yeshua. Because of the shedding of His blood, paying for the debt of our sins and His righteousness is now poured out upon us. And now we inherit His righteousness. And now we become royalty. And it's the greatest royal blood you could ever see. And we see that uh, describing our king and, and praising our God as king, the very first page of scripture speaks about Adonai being above all of creation. When it says, Bereshi bara Elohim et ha shemaim ve et ha aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Not in the beginning of man, but in the beginning. That uninterrupted, that God created the heavens and the earth. There was no age before that, but God created the beginning. And in that beginning, he created the heavens, he created the earth. And that declares his kingship and his sovereignty over creation. He is not a part of creation. He is above and outside of creation and, and superior to creation. Yeah. He always was and always shall be. He is without beginning. He is without end. And we see that various uh, parts of the scriptures, again, confirm his place as creator and as sovereign over the world and his kingship. And we see in uh, Psalm 33, in verse 6, by Adonai's word were the heavens made, and all their hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together in a heap. He lays up deep waters in storehouses. Let all the earth fear Adonai. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Adonai foils the purpose of the nations. He thwarts the plans of the people. The plan of Adonai stands forever. The purposes of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is Adonai the people he chose for his own inheritance. Adonai looks down from heaven, he observes all of humanity. From his dwelling place, he gazes on the inhabitants of the earth. And again, the Bible tells us time and time again, it reveals to us a God that is so great that there is nothing that can be compared to him. And far too many times people uh, mistakenly 
will compare God and say, well, the opposite of God is Hasatan, the devil. The devil is not the opposite of God because he is not sovereign. He is not above creation. God alone is above creation. He alone is God. Hasatan cannot be compared to God. They're not on the same level. If you're going to use an opposite of Hasatan, then you would have to use one of the other angels. Gabriel or Michael or any of the other angels. Because Hasatan is a fallen angel. He is not a creator. He never created anything. He's just a fraud. And he's a cheap copycat. And anything that he attempts to create never holds up. It always falls and crumbles. There is no comparison to God. There is no equal to him. There is no one else that we can compare him to. He is unchanging. His character does not change. He is eternal. He is without beginning and without end. And that's what we celebrate tonight in Rosh Hashanah. We celebrate our God as king and we celebrate him as creator. That he is far and away high and above all creation. And there is none that can be compared to him. Um, we think about, in an earthly sense, to all the celebration that goes on in the coronation of a new king or a queen, and all the fanfare that goes on, and it's nothing compared to the celebration and the coronation of, of God as king. All of heaven praises him. All of heaven rejoices and shouts and declares him to be king above all of creation. Rosh Hashanah is a sanctified reminder to us of Adonai's authority in our lives because he is king. He's king over the world. He's king over all nations, all leaders of nations. He's king over every circumstance and every situation. There is nothing outside of his view. There's nothing outside of, of his mind. You know, there's nothing hidden from him. He sees and knows everything. Everything. Nothing escapes his presence. Psalm 47 celebrates this kingship of our God. And it references shouts or teruah and shofar blasts of his coronation. Psalm 47 verse 1. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with cries of joy. For Adonai El Yon is awesome, a great king over the earth. He makes peoples subject to us, puts nations under our feet. He chooses our heritage for us, the pride of Yaakov, whom he loves, Selah. God goes up to shouts of acclaim, Adonai to a blast on the shofar. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is king over all the earth. Sing praises in a maskeel. God rules the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The leaders of the people gather together and the people of the God of Abraham. For the rules of the earth belong to God who is exalted on high. Jewish tradition speaks of this day and it makes a reference to the book of life and we see that as we begin this evening with Eric that uh, from this moment forward we have 10 days between now and Yom Kippur the day of atonement and these 10 days are referred to as the 10 days of awe and it's during these 10 days that traditionally Jewish people will uh, repent of their sins and they will reflect upon this past year in their actions. And uh, they will attempt to do good deeds and good acts in order to increase their chances of having their name inscribed in the book of life. And they believe that change through repentance and good acts will give them this status and this standing to have their name written in the book of life. And there is a tragic and yet severe problem 
with this tradition? Because first of all, it's not scriptural. Because there is no such thing as salvation based on acts. There's nothing you can do to earn your way to salvation. This does not line up with the scriptures of the Tanakh, of the Older Covenant readings. Man has a problem and a condition, and it's called sin. And sin is an act of rebellion towards Adonai. And sin will cause separation in a relationship between him and his creation. And man cannot heal himself. He is powerless to heal himself of the stain of sin and the consequences of sin. What is imperfect, what is imperfect cannot help another that is imperfect. In this case, a negative and a negative does not equal a positive. The older covenant scriptures tell us that all have sinned. In Ecclesiastes 7.20, for there isn't a righteous person on earth who does only good and never sins. The prophet Jeremiah says in 17.19 that the heart is deceitful more than anything else and it is mortally sick. The prophet Ezekiel tells us that the consequence of sin is death. In Ezekiel 18.20, the person who sins is the one that will die. The great prophet Isaiah tells us in 59.2 that sin causes separation from God. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And we are told in the book of Vayikra, the book of Leviticus in 1711, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. There is no atonement for sin apart from blood. And the blood of bulls and goats does not bring salvation. In the past or in the sacrificial system of the older covenant times, the blood of bulls and goats only provided a temporary covering that allowed the children of Israel to draw near and approach Adonai closer in his tabernacle. The blood of bulls and goats never provided for an eternal salvation. But we see that in the greatness of our God and our King, where for man there is no hope and there is no way, God suddenly makes the way. And he demonstrates his power and his sovereignty and his glory over man's condition because he is above it. And he displays his power, his authority and his sovereignty by providing a way. And that is in the form of the Messiah. Atonement is found only in Messiah bearing the penalty of our sin. And Isaiah again tells us in Isaiah 53, 4, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God and stricken by men and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Now, unfortunately, there are some in, within rabbinic Judaism that will try to tell you that what Isaiah is speaking about here in Isaiah 53 is that he's speaking to Israel. That, he, that the belief is that this is Israel that he's speaking of. Israel cannot heal itself. Israel cannot sacrifice for the sake of itself. In the Newer Covenant readings, John tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is God's plan. This is God's plan of salvation that he has made. Providing his son to be the perfect uh, sacrifice for sin. The spotless, sinless lamb. 
And the psalmist tells us in Psalm 2 that refuge is found alone in the Son, the Messiah. In Psalm 2.11, we're told, Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. The psalmist is telling us that we are to worship the Lord and that we are to do homage to the Son. And the Son is Messiah Yeshua. And we celebrate tonight Adonai as our king. We celebrate tonight Yeshua as our king. Yeshua Malkeinu, Yeshua Moshienu. Yeshua our king, Yeshua our deliverer. And Jesus, Yeshua, publicly declared himself in John 12, 44, that those who put their trust in me are trusting not merely in me, but in the one who sent me. He says, I have come as a light into the world so that everyone who trusts in me might not remain in the dark. Paul speaks of the authority of the king. One of the many offices of the Messiah is prophet, priest, and king. And Yeshua fulfilled all of these roles. He fulfills the role of the prophet because he speaks on behalf of God. He is the voice of God. He fulfills the role of priest because he is the high priest through the order of Melchizedek. And we have spoken about this uh, in our look upon John 17, the priestly, high priestly prayer. The past three weeks we've been looking at that. That he fulfills the role of the high priest. And he fulfills the role of king because he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And Paul reminds the Colossians about this. In Colossians 1, he writes to them, and he says that Messiah Yeshua is the creator and the sustainer of all things. Colossians 1.14 says, It is through his Son that we have redemption, that our sins have been forgiven. He is the visible image of the invisible God. Amen. He is supreme over all creation, because in connection with him, were created all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, lordships, rulers, or authority. They have all been created through him and for him. He existed before all things, and he holds everything together. Also, he is the head of the body, the messianic community. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might hold first place in everything. And this is what we celebrate tonight. We celebrate the kingship of our God. We celebrate the kingship of our Messiah. Because again, he is the king. He's above everything. He's above this world. He's above the conditions and the situations of this world. He's above the schemes of men and their history. He's sovereign to all things. And we celebrate that because we have our identity in the King of Kings. Our identity is found in Him. Our security is found in Him. Our future is found in Him. He is the King. And He alone sits on the throne. And this is what we celebrate. And we have reason to celebrate it because of what Yeshua did on the tree of redemption. Through the tree of redemption, Yeshua becomes our sovereign king. He becomes our sin covering. He takes on the penalty of the sins of the world. He becomes the substitution. The stain and the impurity of our sins are transferred onto him. And in turn, we receive unmerited righteousness and purity. And this is exactly what Isaiah was speaking of. we see that Messiah Yeshua plays a dual role. He hung on the tree of execution as Messiah Yeshua ben Yosef, the suffering servant. And when he returns, he returns as Messiah Yeshua ben David, the reigning king. Traditionally, 
in, Messi in rabbinic Judaism, they speak about the book of life. They speak about the desire and the hope of having your name written in the book of life. And that is an, a pleasantry that is exchanged uh, amongst uh, Jewish people uh, at this time. Uh, may your name be written in the book of life. And that is something, as a believer in Messiah Yeshua, I cannot say. Because to say, may my name be written in the book of life, is a gray area. It leaves doubt and uncertainty. It's spoken from, from a mindset of, I hope it's there. And this is because when this is spoken within the confines of rabbinic Judaism, it's, it's a hope. It's a hope that's a false hope because it's based on works. I hope I've done enough that my name is in the book of life. I hope that I've repented enough for my sins. And it's all based on what I am doing and what I'm trying to achieve and accomplish. And fallen man cannot save himself. Fallen man cannot save another fallen man. It takes a spotless, perfect sacrifice to cover the, for sin. And that was Messiah Yeshua's role. And he did it gladly and willingly. And for us as, as vessels of honor, as believers in Messiah Yeshua, we never have to say, I hope my name is written in the book of life. I know for a fact that my name is written in the book of life. There's no doubt. There's no gray in here. There's no uncertainty. It's a fact. And it's based on nothing I have done or ever will do. It's based on what Yeshua did on my behalf. And all I did is acknowledge what he has done. And I accept him as the Savior. My name is written in the book of life. And I can say that with confidence, not with arrogance. With, I can say that with confidence and I say it with fear and awe. Because I stand in awe of what he has done willingly going to the tree of execution and I say it with awe when I try to even imagine the love that God has for me that he puts so, that much value in me that he's willing to send his son to die to be the atonement covering with his blood for my sin so that I could be reconciled in a relationship to him. That's how much he loves you. Because he was willing to offer up his son to be that atonement. No one else could have done that. No one else could have stepped in and fulfilled that role. Only Yeshua could. So as believers in Messiah Yeshua, we celebrate this day. We celebrate the king. We honor the king. We cherish the king. We glorify the king. We magnify the king. We praise the king. We honor the king. Yes. We, we, we rejoice and exalt the king. Because it's all about the king. Yes. This day is about the king. Yes. It's not about me saying, well, here I go. It's Rosh Hashanah. I'm now about to enter this 10 days where I'm going to try and make up for everything I did for the last 350 days. So that hopefully my name is written in a book of life. See, because that becomes inward. Because now it's about me. The attention is on me. Because now I'm entering into a period of time from a rabbinic Judaism standpoint, I'm entering into a period of time now where I need to make up for and compensate for my shortcomings. You can't do that. It's not possible. But what happens is, is that it becomes about me and it's inward thinking. And that's not what Rosh Hashanah is about. That's not what any of these biblical feasts are about, these Ha Moedim, these appointed times. Not one of them is about you. 
Every single one of them is about Adonai, our God, our Heavenly Father. And every single one of them is about Messiah Yeshua, His Son. Both of them are glorified. Both of them are exalted in every one of these feasts. And both of them are the center point of every one of these feasts. And that's why they are appointed times. There are times for us that God has commanded for us to observe and honor them. So that we come together as believers in a body of Messiah. We come together as one. As one new creation. As one new man. Doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile. Doesn't matter whether you're male or female. Doesn't matter whether you're young or old. Slave or free. We all come together as one. And we honor God for who he is and what he has done. And we praise his one and only son for who he is and what he has done. And that's what every one of these feasts are all about. They're about celebrating them. It's not about me. It's not about looking into me. But it's about looking at them and worshiping and exalting and magnifying and glorifying and, glorifying and praising them. That's what the feasts are all about. And these feasts were ordained by God, established by God for us so that we can come together with him during these specific periods of time throughout the calendar year. They're like special dates with God. The biblical feast, that's what they really are. It's like a special date with God. He's appointed the time. He has set the time. And he says, meet me here. On this day, I want to meet with you here. I want to go on a specific, special date with you on this calendar day. And when we come together, I want to share myself with you. I want to reveal myself with you to you. And I want to show you a, a, a different aspect about who I am. And Rosh Hashanah is the date that he has set, that he has invited us to come together, enter into his presence, because he wants to share with you about his kingship. So that we can learn about Adonai as king. You know, if you think about like a diamond, and a diamond has many facets on it. And many times we see God referenced as a diamond. Because there's, you know, we'll spend all eternity learning about God. Amen. And we see all these different characteristics and attributes of who God is just by the different angles. And it's on this day, this feast, that God's desire is, I want to show you about my kingship. This is what I want you to focus on today. I want you to focus on my kingship, my sovereignty, my authority, my power, that I am above everything. Whatever it is, I am above it. Everything is beneath me. Everything sits at my feet. And everything is subject to my command. And I want you to see me in that light on this day. So that we can get to know him as our God and our king. Our vino malcano. Our father, our king. We learn by repetition. That's how we learn. That's how we're designed as humans. We learn by repetition. Repetition. And every year he wants to meet on this feast day. So that we can again be reminded and learn more about his kingship and his sovereignty and his power and his glory and his authority. And it becomes a reminder for us so that as we go about our days and we go through the web and flow of daily life and the ups and downs, the trials and tribulations, he wants you to remember Rosh Hashanah. So when something isn't going well, or you're struggling in an area with something, he wants you to think about Rosh Hashanah. And he wants to whisper into your heart, fear not. Because I am king. 
Fear not because I sit on the throne. Fear not because I am all powerful and everything is beneath me. I'm in charge of everything. Nothing escapes me. Nothing escapes my attention. Nobody gets away with anything. And a time of judgment will come. And there's a time when you will have to answer, which is all of humanity will have to answer. And for those who have rejected the king's son, there is no answer. But these Hamoadim, these appointed times, that's what they're about. They're about us coming together to learn about our God, to learn about our Savior, because they are both glorified in every one of these feast days. That's why they're God's feasts. They're biblical feasts. They're His appointed time. They're not Jewish feasts. See, the problem with that thinking is, is that, well, okay, this is something for Jewish people. It's not for me as a Gentile. That's wrong thinking, especially if you're a believer. Because if you're a believer in Jesus, then you should be celebrating whatever glorifies him. Amen. You should be acknowledging anything that glorifies him, anything that exalts him. In your mind, you'll be saying, well, wait a minute, I want in on that. I should be, I should be a part of that because I'm part of his body. <laughs> If I'm a Christian, then that means that I should be celebrating his feast. Mm -hmm. Because it exalts him, and anything that exalts him, anything that glorifies him, anything that puts him at the center, then that means that I should be involved in that, I should be witnessing that, I should be participating in that. So to have this thing, this thought that, well, these are Jewish feasts is wrong. He had given them first to the Jew. But just like the best of the good news, it goes first to the Jew and then to the Gentiles. So these feasts were first presented to the Jewish people. But it wasn't meant to be just theirs. Because they are meant to be the light to the world. They are the ones that are to bring everyone else to, to the presence of God. That was their calling. But these biblical feasts, they're special days, they're special times. And it's a reminder for us, because we need the reminders. And we need to be reminded that God sits on the throne. I mean, you can turn on the news and you can hear about the craziest, wackiest stuff that's going on in this world. And it's getting crazier, and it's getting wackier, it's getting more demonic. But it's okay. And I don't mean it's okay that these things happen. But I mean it's okay, don't fear it. Because our God is king. And he's sovereign over men. He's sovereign over the history of mankind. So it's not that okay. we should be okay with these things. Because we need to be praying for this world. And we need to be praying for the unsaved of this world. But when I say it's okay, what I mean by that is, is that we should not get caught up in fear over what's happening. Yeshua himself told us that these things would take place. But when we remember Rosh Hashanah, we remember that our God is king and that our Savior is king. And all authority in heaven and on earth was given to the Son. So our Lord and our Savior, Messiah Yeshua, has all authority. So if he has all authority, and the scripture says that all authority has been given to him, how much authority does the devil have? Zero. Zero. He doesn't have any. Because all of authority belongs to Yeshua. So that means that the enemy has no authority. But in our minds, we seem to think, oh, he does have authority over certain things. He doesn't. That's, that's just the fool that's continuing to play the copycat. And his time is coming to an end very quickly. Amen. 
He's deceived himself into thinking he's more than he was, and that's what caused his initial problem. He forgot that he's a created being. And his desire was to be like El Elyon. And El Elyon is one of God's names, which means most high. He, wanted, he didn't just want to be like God. He wanted to be most high. That was the title that he coveted. But he forgot that he was a created being. He's not a creator. Don't treat him like a creator because he doesn't create. He only puts together with cheap tape and glue falsehoods, imitations. He's not capable of creating. There is only one creator, and that is God. He's a sovereign over everything. But that's what Rosh Hashanah is about. It's about celebrating. Celebrating our God as king. Worshipping our God as the highest authority in all of existence. Not just on planet Earth, but in all of existence. He sits on the throne above everything. My name is written in the book of life. And it's not because of anything I've done. It's not because of anything I have done. My name is written in the book of life because of what Yeshua has done. And I just acknowledge that he is my Lord and my Savior. I don't have to do acts and good works to earn salvation because I can't. It's not possible. And this is what is tragic. Because having a heart for our Jewish people, this is what's tragic. Because they will spend these next 10 days trying to earn the right to hopefully have their name written in the book of life. Because they're being deceived and they're being lied to. There's only one way that your name gets written into that book. And Yeshua is holding the pen. And if you deny him, your name is not being written in that book. Doesn't matter what you do. Acts of Sadaka, <coughs> charity, Torah study. These are all things that rabbinic Judaism deceives and lies to its people about. That are ways that you can have your sins atoned for and salvation. Salvation is only through Messiah Yeshua. He holds the pen, and he holds the book. And the only way that he writes and scribes that name down is if they have acknowledged him. He's not concerned about what you've done. He's not concerned about who do you think you are. Consider this, he sends out, during his earthly ministry, he sends out his Talmudim, his disciples, by twos. Two by twos, he sends them out and tells them to go minister to the people. When he gathers them all back and they all return, they're all excited because of the different things that they have, were able to do through the anointing and, and the power of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. He wasn't concerned about what they did. The only question that he pointed at them was, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Am I Savior? Am I King? We exalt our God today. We exalt our Messiah today because He is the Sovereign King. And this is what Rosh Hashanah is about. It's about celebrating Him. It's about exalting Him. It's about making a joyful noise, the Teruah, the joyful noise and exalting and celebrating and worshiping Him. Sounding the blast of the shofar. Bringing glory and praise to Him with the trumpet. And for us as believers in Messiah Yeshua, it's about that anticipation of that great shofar. We're waiting for the sound of that great shofar because when that shofar blast comes, it'll be a blast like no other shofar has ever blasted. And when that shofar blasts, we will hear it around the world. And when that shofar blasts, we will be forever in the presence of our Savior. 
never to be separated from him ever again. We celebrate Rosh Hashanah as the head of the year, the beginning of the year. And we see the connection to the story of creation. Well, I shouldn't say the story of creation, the fact of creation. Because it's fact. And from the very beginning, Yeshua was there. And we're told that he in all things were created by him and all things are sustained by him. Why does this earth spin? It spins because he wants it to. It continues to spin because he commands it to. The sun continues to rise because he commands the sun to rise. Everything about our existence is, is by the authority of Yeshua. We celebrate the head of the year. We celebrate God, the God of all creation. <coughs> We celebrate this new year, 5780. New year is about new beginnings. It's another reason to celebrate today. You know, God is a God of new beginnings. You know, when we receive him as Lord and Savior, we become a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Today is a new beginning. It's a new year. The scriptures tell us that every day is a new beginning. And God's mercies are renewed every day. God is about beginnings. And we celebrate this new year. Within rabbinic Judaism, there is the belief of what is known as tikkun olam. Tikkun olam is about restoring and repairing the world. And it's the, and it's the belief that, I mean, it's, it's a nice belief. It's a belief about... Uh, that as, as uh, the people of God, we have a responsibility to do our best to make this world a better place. To do our best to restore the world or repair the world, so to speak. It's a nice concept because what it does is it calls upon us to be conscious of our actions and how our life impacts the world and how our life impacts the environment. And those are all good things. But the reality is, is that we can't repair anything or restore anything. God restores. God makes all things new. But today's a new year. It's a new beginning, a new opportunity. New beginnings require new decisions. So if I just keep doing the old thing and I keep doing the same old thing, then I haven't done anything new. But new beginnings require new decisions. And if we're talking about new beginnings, we're talking about change. We're talking about transformation. We're talking about growth. A new beginning requires us to do something different. You can't have a new beginning without change. And it wouldn't be a beginning. Sometimes it requires a change in our action, a change in our focus, a change in our commitment. I recall Moshe and the second generation as they were in the wilderness. And as the second generation is on the footstep of entering into the promised land, Moshe speaks to them and he presents for them a choice to be made, an option. He puts a fork in their road. The promised land lays right before them, but before they enter that promised land, Moshe puts a fork right in the middle of the road. And he says, I present to you the blessings and I present the curses. I present the good and the bad. And he, told, and he gives them the answer, choose life. Life, death, good, bad, blessings, cursings. He lays it out for them. And he tells them to choose life, make the choice for life. And standing before them was the young and the old, the male, the female, the slave and the free, the Israelite as well as the foreigner. 
See, people seem to forget that there were foreigners among the children of Israel in the wilderness that left Egypt with them. Because again, that's God's ultimate plan, is for all to be together, for all to be one. But Rosh Hashanah is about celebrating the creation, celebrating the king over the creation, that sits on the throne, that sits in authority, and we exalt him and we praise him for who he is. And we remind ourselves that he is king and that he's sovereign. And we need those reminders because it's very easy for life to get you down. But we need to remind ourselves daily that God, my God is king. My savior is king. And he will have the final word and he will have the final say. And yes, it's important too that you remember that you're royalty. But your royalty comes from Yeshua. So our head doesn't get too big. It's not from what we've done. It's because of what he's given to us. But this is what Rosh Hashanah is about. It's, it's not about mocking the beginning of a new year and let's look back on the old year and try to fix what we did so that we can have our names in the, in the book of life. It's about looking up and seeing God as king and seeing our savior as king, sitting on the throne with all authority given to him. And we celebrate that and we honor that. And as we begin this new year, we begin it with excitement. We, we begin it with great anticipation because it's a new day, it's a new beginning. God's mercies are renewed every day. New beginnings are great. Imagine if we approach the life with that kind of an attitude. Every day we wake up and say, wow, this is going to be a great day. Because it's a new beginning. It's a new day. You haven't gotten out of bed yet, and you already should be praising God with your lips. Thank you for this new day, Lord. Thank you for this new beginning. Thank you that your mercies are new. Thank you that yesterday's gone. And that today's a brand new day with brand new potential. With a brand new hope and a brand new purpose. And maybe I didn't do too good yesterday, but but today's a brand new day. And today's a clean, it's a clean slate. And I could start fresh. Rosh Hashanah is about exalting our God acknowledging who he is, celebrating him. And that's why we come together. And it's, what, it's God's desire. It's the desire of his heart because he established and ordained these, these feasts for us to come together as brothers and sisters to fellowship with one another and corporately exalt and praise him as our king. And that's why we saw in our worship today that our music was reflective of, of God being king and celebrating his kingship. And that he sits on the throne. And that's how we should begin every single day. Every day we should begin like it's Rosh Hashanah. Every day we should wake up and, and rejoice and celebrate that my God is king and celebrate that I sit on the throne. Maybe you don't like your job. Been there. But you know what? Maybe while you're going to that job, you might hate as you're driving or sitting on a train or whatever you're doing. How about starting with a new attitude and rejoicing God and praising God? You have a job. Amen. You have a job. You woke up today. You know, I, I, I love to speak about this because it's, it's so true that if you were to actually... Thank God for every little detail. And you really were to try and take stock of every little thing. You wouldn't accomplish anything the entire day, the 24-hour period. Because you'd be thanking him for every single thing. You'd be thanking him that you woke up this morning in your bed. First you thank him that you woke up. Then you can thank him. Oh, we're not even at dark. You didn't even get out of bed yet. You thank him that you woke up. You thank him that you're in a bed. 
Amen. You thank you that you have a roof over your head that protected you from the elements last night when it rained. Or when it's 32 degrees outside and snowing. Then you thank them that I'm physically able to get out of the bed. And so on and so on. I mean, you'll, you'll take the whole day to just be sitting there thanking them. And 24 hours will pass and you won't, you won't have had time to thank them for every single thing. If you took stock of every single detail. Because not everyone's going to wake up tomorrow. And not everyone's going to a warm bed tonight. And not everyone's, forget about a bed. Some people aren't even going to be sleeping under a roof tonight. And some people aren't going to bed tonight with, with food in their stomach. I mean, you can go on and on and on. But, you know, every day is a new day. And every day should be Rosh Hashanah for us. Celebrating my God as King. Celebrate Him every day as King. Exalt Him every day. Rejoice in Him every day. And that's what we do in Rosh Hashanah. It's not about us. It's not a, it, it doesn't become the beginning point of, of, of our looking inward. It's about looking up and praising Him for who He is and what He has done. Hallelujah. And as I close with this message, I present that opportunity for anyone who has never received Yeshua as Lord and Savior. What perfect day can there be than, than on Rosh Hashanah? Every day is a perfect day to receive Him. But today is a, a better day to receive Him than tomorrow. Because nobody's guaranteed tomorrow. That's why the prophet Isaiah says, Today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, harden not your heart. See, it's interesting that it says, it says, if you hear his voice, it doesn't say, if God decides to cry out to you. It says, if you hear his voice, he's calling out continuously. He's standing at the door and he's knocking continuously. He's the father and the prodigal son that's standing there continuously waiting for the return of his son. But the onus is on us. Do we hear him today? Do we hear the knocking? Do we open the door? He has sent out the invitation. The question is, do we receive it? Do we act upon it? And that's what makes this a perfect opportunity because it's a perfect opportunity for us to receive this invitation. To accept him as Lord, to accept him as Savior. And to start with a brand new beginning. And I present this opportunity to anyone who has never received him. You've never made the decision for him. We present this opportunity to acknowledge him as Lord, to acknowledge him as Savior, and to invite him into your heart. And when that happens, you now become royalty. When that happens, you now receive eternal life. When that happens, you now have a new identity with a new beginning, with a new purpose, with a new destiny. All because of what he has done, not because of what we think we do. So I present this opportunity. If this is the desire of your heart, then join me in this declaration, this heartfelt statement, this prayer. Asking and receiving him into your heart, acknowledging who he is and what he has done. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for who you are, that you are the king that sits on the throne. Father, I praise you and I worship you because you alone are sovereign above all else. And that my sin has caused a separation between us and there's nothing that I can do to fix that. I can't repair that. I can't work towards that. But out of your greatness and your love and mercy, you have sent your one and only son, Messiah Yeshua. And he came as the atoning sacrifice with the shedding of his blood on the tree of sacrifice that he became the perfect spotless lamb that takes away the sin of the world. And that he died and shed his blood for my sin. Taking on my sin and giving me his righteousness. And in doing so now I have a restored relationship with you. 
and that you now give me a new beginning with a new identity. And you bless me even further by giving me the gift of your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, which now joins itself with my spirit, coming into my heart to teach me, to guide me, to train me, and to correct me according to your ways. So I acknowledge Yeshua as my Savior. I acknowledge that he died on the tree of salvation for my sins, and that he died and that he rose again on the third day, and that he now sits at your right hand on the throne in all power and authority and glory. And I acknowledge and I make you Lord over my life, that I submit my life to you to walk according to your will and your ways, that I no longer live my life for myself, but that I live it for you and for your glory and the advancement of your kingdom. And I thank you and I praise you for all that you have done in the one name, the only name, the one who holds the pen, the one who holds the book of life, the name that is above every other name, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, that Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, is Lord. And I thank you and I praise you in his name. Amen. 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 Well, at this time, we're going to have the sounding of our shofar, a time of celebrating and rejoicing. To hear the shofar, we're commanded... Uh, Adonai commands us in the scriptures, he commands us to hear the shofar. And um, we see that in uh, this prayer, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Alam Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvotah Vitzavanu Lishmoa Kol Shofar. Blessed are you, Lord our God, Master of the Universe, who sanctified us with his commands and commands us to hear the sound of the shofar. He wants us to hear the shofar, and that's why we blow the shofar and sound the shofar on this day. And we're going to uh, worship him with a song. And as we do so, uh, our shofarettes, <laughs> Joko, I know Nellie was feeling under the weather, but uh, she's going to try. Um, but we're going to worship him and sing the song. And while we're doing that, um, they're going to uh, blast the shofar for us. You can stand up if you want. We're celebrating our king. Stretch the legs a little bit. Oh, 